to the Fairland and Brix Cheney existing conditions presentation. This is going to be a series of public meetings, so you can participate in our Fairland Brix Cheney master plan. I'm here with our esteemed members of the planning department and the parks department and members of the community. My name is Prathav Verma. I'm the current vice chair of the Montgomery County Planning Board. I was appointed about three years ago. I'm also a longtime East County resident. I moved to the area in 1992, uh, went to high school at Paint Branch High School, class of 1996. And this is very much uh, my hometown. And so it's an honor and privilege to kick off this meeting. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking a lot about what is currently happening in uh, the greater Fairland and Brick Shaney, uh uh, area and it's going to really be a impetus for a larger discussion we'll have down the road about visioning for this particular corridor. You know, as we all know, East County is a very interesting place. It's the crossroads of, of a variety of uh, places. It, it uh, goes well into towards uh, Howard County. It connects with Prince George's and it's often uh, been a part of the county that uh, has kind of struggled with its own identity. You know, it was decidedly a rural space uh, in the 80s and the 90s, and then you had the advent of the inter-county connector. But it's always had, um, you know, interesting places. It's had Amish markets. It's had a connection to Burtonsville. Uh, White Oak uh, was one of the first commercial areas to develop in that part of the county many, many years ago. And we've seen the area change in ways where uh, sometimes our voices may not have been heard. And that's why this kind of equitable engagement is so important that you, the neighbors, the community members, stakeholders, you all know your community better than anyone else does. You know every stop sign, you know every parking lot, you know every housing development. And you also know where we can improve. So part of the reason why we're having this meeting is to not only discuss what is currently in place in this area, but also to hear from you uh, on not only those existing conditions, but as we move forward towards the visioning process of uh, uh, what this area can be in the future. And so uh, I'm excited about the prospects of uh, working on the progress we've made, whether it's uh, the flash bus system and incorporating future opportunity sites around that rapid bus system. Uh, also reimagining the Route 29 corridor. You know, for the longest time, State Highway Administration really looked at this area as a way to just pass through. And if you talk to a lot of East County people, they will say, if we want to have a good time, we'll go to Columbia, Maryland, or we'll go to downtown Silver Spring. Or even these days, we'll go to Laurel because Laurel now has a town center, but people are proud to be East County residents. They love this area. It is a one of the most diverse areas uh, in the county. And we also have our issues as well. We know we have many areas where speeding constantly is occurring. Route 29 is very dangerous for pedestrians. And we also have issues with crime. So these are all things that we hopefully will be able to address, talk about, and get people excited about the future of this part of the county that many people often feel have been, has been forgotten. And our job is to let everyone know that not only have you not been forgotten, but we're excited to talk about the future. And with that, I'm gonna kick it off to Molly Jackson, who's going to talk about the rest of the agenda for this evening. Thank you so much, Commissioner Varma. We appreciate you for taking the time out to give us this great welcome and this great introduction to a great place, Fairland and Briggs Cheney. I'm also going to ask for permission from my co-host and my co-lead to share my screen so I can get us started with grounding us in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community. I know most of you on the phone or on, the, on this call in this conference room, in this space, probably already know a little something about Fairland and Briggs Cheney, but I just want to get us um, grounded and make sure that everyone is on the same page with um, the area that we're we're really talking about here. So I'm going to share my screen. Thank you very much to Clark, and put this into presentation mode. 
and give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen okay someone good thank you so much all right so we are talking about the Fairland and Briggs Cheney Master Plan. And for those of you who have joined us for other sessions, including our listening sessions and our speaker series, thank you for staying in touch. Thank you for staying engaged with the process. We greatly appreciate your time. And um, I want you to know that um, all of the members of our team are here with the exception of our supervisor who had to attend a meeting um, in, in, in Damascus, I believe. And, but we do have our chief here with us. So um, tonight's gonna go a little unconventional. Normally we're, we're kind of giving you a presentation and talking at you, um, but we're, we want you to, we encourage you to um, share any questions that you have based on the information and the data that is going to be um, presented to you and, and discussed tonight. I want you to share your questions in the chat um, and, and feel free to, um, you know, Ask for clarifying information if you need that. We're going to um, bring your question into the conversation. Um, I'm going to get us started again with just a grounding of where we are and what we're talking about when we say Fairland and Briggs Cheney. But also, first, let me just get us um, focused on the process, our schedule so far. I know many of you have probably already seen this image, but we are still, um, we're about a year into this process. It's hard to believe that the time has flown by so quickly. But as of April of 2021, we actually presented the scope of work to the planning board. And as of recently, we went back to them and presented our findings on the community engagement report. So we're still in the listening stage, but we're gradually moving into the, um, the uh, visioning stage. And so we're in spring right now. So technically we're moving into the visioning stage right now, but we won't stop listening. This is just think of this more so as like a building. So we will never stop listening we will probably stop visioning, but we will continue to have conversations around visioning work. And we'll just keep adding to, to our schedule and keep adding to the data that we've already collected. And so again, in our listening stage, we were, we were heavily out in the community, engaging with the community. We had our partners of Everyday Canvassing helping us. In our listening stage, we also had Story Tapestries. We have a member of Story Tapestries joining us tonight. Um, and you'll probably see these folks again as we talk about visioning with our visioning charrettes moving forward into the future. Um, so right now, as far as our schedule is concerned, we're in spring, we're still listening. We're having this um, existing conditions presentation for you tonight, but we'll have it another, we'll have the full version of the existing conditions presentation to the planning board on the 21st, which is this week, this Thursday, please tune in. It's probably gonna happen around one o'clock um, and then we will start moving. We have a couple of um, community engagement events coming up, but um, be on the lookout for some visioning charrettes that we would love for you to participate in. Um, so our existing conditions presentation really hones in on four different areas. There's the regional context. We just wanna ground you in what we're calling the Fairland and Briggs Cheney uh, master plan. This is a subset of the 1997 plan. And you can see the area highlighted in black on the right side of the screen. So I'm going to give you that context with these next few slides. And then we're going to focus on the people who live in the place. We have a series of questions that we'll ask our team really honing in on who are the people that live, work, and play, and enjoy life in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community. Then we're going to gradually transition into what we're calling the built environment. And that has everything to do with land use, zoning, development patterns, transportation, housing, and schools. And then we'll move into the um, natural environment, finish off with um, the environment and uh, food, food systems. So some of the key takeaways from um, these areas, just to kind of give you a high level perspective and kind of summarize some of the information that you're gonna hear tonight. Um, yes, uh, Fairland and Briggs Cheney is very, transportation rich, very connected, very, um, there's a regional, there's a regional draw um, because of its connection to other parts of, uh, whether it be Prince George's County or Howard County, it's very accessible. Uh, Route 29 takes you down, um, downtown Silver Spring and Wheaton, our Wheaton headquarters is not too far from the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community. Um, the people who live there, very diverse. It's a very diverse community with a um, heavy concentration of Black and African-Americans. 
um, people who speak multiple languages, which which can't be understated as far as cultural competency and, and having a richness to their to their culture in the community. Uh, the built environment, while there's um, it is it is heavy in the suburban category, that is for sure. Um, they we they don't. Fairland and Briggs Cheney doesn't have direct access to a metro, but we do have the flash BRT station, which is the first in the county introduced on this side of, of the county. Um, like Commissioner Varma has said, there's still some issues around safety and, um, and crime. Um, and so the, the communities are also dealing with um, un, unaffordable housing, but affordable housing. And so there's the conversation around renting versus owning. And last but not least, um, the natural environment. There's tons of um, there. Well, there's there's a heavy interest, and in, um, everyone loves the lushness of the landscape that they live. I mean, the, the apartment buildings and the townhouses are surrounded by um, uh, lush trees and back into park areas. But some of the the um, businesses, the bigger businesses, and the um, shopping center, the shopping center areas have. Lots of impervious surfaces that um, that that you'll hear a lot about um, tonight. And um, as far as food is concerned, this this region of the county is also included in our equity focus area. So we'll be talking a little bit about the um, uh, food insecurity that exists in the community as well. So again, this area. One of the things that you'll notice about this map right here is that it is very transportation rich. Um, you have the I I ninety five corridor. You have the CCT. I mean, you have the ICC. Excuse me, the inter inter county connector. You have the Briggs Cheney Road, Route twenty nine, which is a connector goes all the way up to to Baltimore and and reaches to Washington D C. Um, again, we're talking about the eastern region of the county, so it is right up against the the boundary of Prince George's County and Howard County. And like I said, this master plan is highlighted in black. So you can see the subset of the 1997 plan, as well as some neighboring master plans that um, development is already occurring in those areas. And so we wanna be mindful of what's planned for the future. But for this conversation in particular, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, we're gonna start with the people. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now because we wanna get into some of these interviews and dive a little bit deeper. Um, into, into this conversation that we would love to have with you. So the first step, first of, of, of many members, of many valuable members to our team is um, Brian Crane. And um, we can go ahead and make this a gallery view if we, if we can, maybe my screen is not in gallery view, but um, I would ask that my team members go ahead and show your face so the residents can place a name with a, a name and a face and a face with a name. Um, but my first question is going to go to Brian Crane. Good evening, Brian Crane. Do you want to introduce yourself? I mean, you're our great, um, he works in our um, historic preservation office and um, I'm going to let him introduce himself really quick. But while you're introducing yourself, also include what are the historic sites in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney um, community so we can get right into it. So introduce yourself first and then go ahead and answer the question. Uh, so my name is Brian Crane. Uh, I'm the archaeologist with the Historic Preservation Program in the Montgomery County Planning Department. And um, so quickly, there, there are a number of historic sites uh, in or very near the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan area. So there are two properties that have been found to be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. One of them is the Conley House, the Green Ridge House, built around 1910. That's right on Old Columbia Pike. Uh, and then there's the Lacey Shaw House, built in 1924. It's an, an American bungalow style house. And it reflects the, the legacy of the automobile here in, in Fairland Briggs Cheney. Um, like other suburb, unlike other suburbs in, in, the, in Montgomery County, there was never a streetcar or a railroad here. So it didn't develop the way Tacoma Park or, or, uh, or Rockville or Kensington did or, or, or Chevy Chase. Um, and it really wasn't until the automobile became popular in the 1920s that you started to get suburban development in, in Fairland. And, and, and the, what had been a really just a rural character really started to change at that time. Um, there are three master plan historic sites. What that means is that those are sites um, that are actually formally listed 
on our master plan for historic sites. And th those include um, the, the Valley Mill site, actually in, um, in our parks uh, area. It was a, an area of 18th and 19th century uh, saw and grist mills. Um, the Conley Greenhouse that I just mentioned, and, and also the Julius Marlowe House. Um, Julius Marlowe House is a, a house belonging to a wealthy 19th century family. A uh, previous um, owner of, of, of that had that house had been a director of the CNO Canal. It was the Duval family, um, and you know the, the the property was owned by a, a succession of people who were very wealthy and very prominent in Montgomery County politics. Uh, we've also got a bunch of cemeteries in and near the the master plan area. So uh, within the plan itself, there is St. Mark's Episcopal Church Cemetery. It's still there. Uh, the church is there, and the and the Cemetery has been there since the 1870s. There's also the, the Conway Jackson Cemetery right in the plan area. So that was a, um, an African-American family or community burial ground that probably developed, if not before emancipation, shortly after. And it was associated with um, the property of a community that, that um, were associated with the property of Ann Downs and probably people that Ann Downs had held in slavery prior to the Civil War. And some of those people after the Civil War purchased their own property, some of it from Ann Downs. Uh, there's a great archeological site that was found as part of the, um, the work for the ICC it was the homestead of Melinda Jackson, a woman who had been held in slavery, who after emancipation bought the land where she had been held in slavery from the woman that had held her in slavery. And she and her family and other people associated with the family lived there for, for a very long time. And they're probably some of them, including her daughter uh, and, and, and another associate of the family and others are buried in the, the Conway Jackson Cemetery. Unfortunately, that site is probably now under US 29, New Columbia Pike. We don't know for certain where it is, but the historical research that we've done so far suggests that that's where it is. So that's, that's really, that's an issue of, of, of equity here uh, in Fairland, as well as not only just the rest of Montgomery County, but, but throughout the United States, is that you have places like the Conley House or the Julius Marlowe House, you know, the, the, the mansion houses of wealthy white families that get preserved while places associated with, with African-Americans and the people who, whose labor really built this place don't survive. I mean, the, the, there's the Sarah Lee um, Family Cemetery that's in, in uh, Calverton Galway Local Park. Well, we know where the site is located, but no headstones survive and her homestead doesn't survive anymore. The same with Melinda Jackson and, and sites associated with, with her Descendants, and there are a number of Melinda Jackson descendants and Sarah Lee descendants who still live in the Fairland area. So that's a it's an equity issue that we're keenly aware of in the planning department. And while we can't bring those places back necessarily, we can certainly find them. We, and so we are actively doing historical and archaeological research, not only here in Fairland but across the county, to identify where these places are so that we can preserve what's left of them. And so that, the, that everybody in the public can understand what these places were, where they were, and the stories of the people who lived and worked in those places. Um, did, I, did that cover what you wanted? Yes, you absolutely did. You did. No, you did a wonderful job. You, but I wanna, I wanna make this point because I don't think I stated this from the beginning. Um, history is a huge component for for the Fairland and Brick Shaney community. We're, we're using history as a thread, um, as, a, as a connecting thread throughout the entire presentation of existing conditions. So the only other question I wanna ask you, Brian, because you know I have a love and a passion for art and historic elements and historic context is, you know, why does history matter to Fairland and Brick Shaney? Why are we looking back to look forward? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I would argue that history always matters. I mean, I think it helps to understand where you are to, to understand a little bit about where you've been. So I think in the, the, the particular uh, sort of threads that come to my mind is, is um, you know, the, the plan area is along Columbia Pike and, and old Columbia Pike is a really old road. Uh, the Columbia Pike Turnpike Company was chartered 
I think it was 1810. And the original vision, I mean, it was chartered in Maryland. It was also in the District of Columbia in Virginia. And the idea was it was going to go from Ellicott City all the way into the District of Columbia and then back out into Virginia. And parts of it, it still exists and are called Columbia Pike. So Columbia Pike and Arlington, Columbia Pike and Montgomery County actually were conceptually kind of linked. And so, um, and, and again, as I said, uh, the development from, from a, a fairland, from really a farmland and, and a lot of, you know, wealthy homeowners who held people in slavery, like 30%, 30, 40% of the population in Fairland were people held in slavery before the Civil War, uh, became, um, became first suburban. And then after World War II and the realignment of Columbia Pike, development really took off. And that's where, where Fairland started to become really densely developed and, den and, and much more densely populated. So the automobile from the 1920s through World War II and the 1950s is a lot of the story about how Fairland developed the way that it did. And the, and the map kind of says that too, right? Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Brian. I'm going to jump to Pam Sorich, who is um, a great member of our team and has had long history at the planning department. It's been a pleasure to work with you, by the way, Pam Sorich. My question to you after you introduce yourself, of course, um, I wanted to ask you about how the community has evolved demographics. I want you to kind of get us, get us into the weeds a little bit about um, the demographics of the place and tell us and tell us a little bit about how the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community has evolved over time. And I, I look forward to that conversation. I, um, my name is Pamela Zorich. I'm from the Research and Strategic uh, Project Group in the Planning Department. I uh, do a lot of uh, demographic analysis, looking at census data, uh, survey work, that type of thing. So I, um, I really enjoy taking a look, a closer look at this community. I, I drive through it, I visit it often, uh, and it's a chance for me to actually put numbers to the area I, I see or drive through. Um, I have to say that uh, Brian has very nicely set the scene describing the historic changes and their influences on the modern community. And I think my focus is in comparison, it's gonna be the more recent population changes uh, since 1990. Uh, so let's consider like the population growth uh, in the area and then the accompanying racial change. I think that these are very distinctive characteristics, uh, characteristics for this area. So the, the Fairland study area, which is that broader area that Molly showed us in that map, um, has about 38,000 residents in, in there about in, in 2020. So, um, you know, how do we get to this level of population, right? So since 1990, the study area gained about 9,000 people. And or, so that's a, increasing about a third over 30 years, which is, you know, it sounds like a lot, but it's a little bit less than what the county uh, uh, witnessed during the same time period. But uh, what the key difference is, is the fact that almost two thirds of the population growth uh, since 1990 in, in the Fairland area occurred in one decade between uh, 2000 and 2010. So what we're seeing is that th there's this fast paced uh, uh, decade of the 2000s and the area gained over 5,700 people. And that's, you know, let's throw some numbers out there, right? And that's an 18% increase. So this, uh, this local population in Fairland, you know, was, a, uh, was growing at a faster pace than the county as a whole was during that decade. And I think that that's in interesting. Um, the, uh, and, and I bring that to, to light because in comparison to the area's population growth in the past decades, like since 2010, we've actually, uh, the area's only seen uh, a, a population increase of about 2% gain. So you can see that that, that one decade of 18% growth, like it really sets the standard of what happened and, and pretty much kind of uh, set this framework for that area and then being followed by a, a slower population gain. So I think that you know, uh, population growth is, is an interesting characteristic of the area and a very telling characteristic. But with this population growth is, um, a, is the shifts in the racial and his, uh, Hispanic distribution since 1990, which accompanied this population growth. And I think it gives us great insight into the area's changing community when we start looking at these you know, stats of, of racial distribution. So, 
just to kind of set the scene, in the 1990s, the study area was a majority non-Hispanic white, just like the rest of the county. Uh, that was That's what the county was in the 90s. Uh, and with uh, a notable distinction for uh, Fairlawn of, of the 90s is it also had a pretty, um, a pretty notable concentration of uh, uh, African-American residents at that time. Uh, you know, um, over the decades, the percentage of African-Americans steadily increased from about a quarter percent of the 25% uh, of the population in 1990. And then by 2020, over half of the area's population was black uh, or African-American. So uh, when you see uh, the comparison of the, the racial distribution in Fairland, it's, um, it is far more racially diverse than the county as a whole. Uh, when we take a look at the percentage of people of color, uh, you know, as a marker, it's like, you know, 84% of the Fairland residents is, uh, um, are people of color compared to about 59% that we see across the county. Awesome. I mentioned at the very beginning of this um, that Fairland and Briggs Cheney was in what we call our equity focus areas. Could you, one, explain what an equity focus area is? And two, just give us a little bit of context for Fairland and Briggs Cheney specifically? Exactly. So um, our, our research group uh, has put together a uh, analysis of uh, certain characteristics across the county that we thought was uh, um, a good uh, demarcation of finding vulnerable populations. So we uh, uh, did analysis and pretty much so, you know, identified what we're calling equity focus areas, uh, you know, parts in the county that are characterized by high concentrations of lower income households, uh, people of color and concentrations of individuals who speak uh, English less than very well. So uh, the equity analysis that we uh, did identified about a quarter of the county's population, and that's about 276,000 people, uh, live in equity focused areas. Uh, and they're pretty much clustered in, um, in the county near Germantown and Gaithersburg and along that I-270 corridor. And then uh, located in mid-county uh, in the Aspen Hill, Wheaton areas, along the Route 29, and then in the eastern portion of the down county uh, area abutting uh, Prince George's County. And that's the, you know, the, the interest for Fairland, right? Because the Fairland study area falls into this, this eastern cluster of equity focus areas. Uh, the Fairland area has about you know, five out of the seven uh, census tracts that make up the general Fairland area. They're designated as equity focus areas. Uh, and this designation is based on um, concentrations of low income households and people of color. So uh, the fact that uh, this area has, uh, you know, has such a uh, high proportion of equity focus areas in the general community is a telling uh, marker for uh, us to, to be able to, you know, um, to talk about the vulnerable uh, communities, to talk about food insecurities and, and the, all the other associated uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues that uh, confront vulnerable populations. So, uh, you know, just to, to give a framework for that, you know, of, uh, I guess, of note, about 60% of the population in the Fairland study area ends up, uh, is living in an equity focus area. That's, again, it's, you know, five out of the seven tracks, so you expect to have a pretty high uh, concentration of, of people in those areas. Again, thank you so much. You're very thorough with your answers. I'm with the numbers. <laughs> you're there good. You go. You're good. So I'm going to skip to Clark now, who is my new co-lead. I'm going to introduce Clark Carson, who is very familiar with planning, not new to planning at all. Comes to us from Rockville, but very new to, fairly new. I think he's jumping headfirst into the Fairland and Briggs Cheney master plan. So. Um, Clark, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, but when you, after you introduce yourself, please let us know, we're getting into the land use and, and into the built environment, how the community has evolved over time, and please, you know, give us some historic context in, in your response. Clark? Right. Thanks, Molly. Uh, that's a good one. So for everyone, I'm Clark Larson. Um, yes, she's right, just jumping in as of February this year, but helping Molly move this forward and I have been out there several times, so I know the, the area to some extent, um, but I, I am learning more and more as we get into it, and I'll be um, helping to co-lead this project and, and focusing on the land use components with Molly and others. 
Um, so I think as, as has already been said, much of this area was formerly rural countryside, fields, farms, forests, um, just like the rest of Montgomery County, but really started to get suburbanized in the 1950s and 60s with um, not only people moving to the area, but also roads uh, bringing them there, having more access to the area. Um, and now what we see are you know, a set of residential neighborhoods, shopping and employment centers, along the major road corridors, but also in various areas, um, including Burdensville, White Oak. Um, the Fairland area is just one of those concentrations of uh, neighborhoods. Um, there are some detached homes built in the 1950s and 60s along Old Columbia Pike. Um, some are still remaining that date back to the 1900s, but most of the townhomes and apartments um, sort of attached residential that exists in this master plan area that uh, Molly showed you earlier, were really built largely in the 1980s. So that's kind of the era where, when this area exploded and a lot of people moved to the area. Um, so today we see those two primary clusters of residential neighborhoods, one uh, north of Briggs Cheney Road, east of US 29, you're probably very familiar with it, um, primarily uh, communities of townhomes and apartments, um, and another uh, set of neighborhoods west of Old Columbia Pike, South of Randolph Road. Um, this is a mix of detached homes, townhomes, apartments. Um, and then the rest of the master plan area specifically is um, largely office and commercial properties located along US 29. Um, outside of the master plan area, it's primarily detached residential neighborhoods, um, except for a few, like I said earlier, Burtonsville to the north and White Oak to the south are more shopping uh, employment centers, but largely this area in East County is um, lower density residential neighborhoods to, to the greatest extent. And so there, there is a historical context to this, of course, because the development pattern did not happen in a vacuum. Um, so initially, because it was uh, low in population, limited transportation uh, amenities, environmental factors, there's a lot of topography and, and stream valleys, um, most of the area was just owned by large landowners used as farms and fields. Um, the first county's general plan in 1964 envisioned the area uh, of Fairland uh, that includes sort of the intersection of US 29, Briggs Cheney Road, but, but also north and south of there, um, envisioned it as the edge of a planned corridor city that would be developed along I-95 um, sort of where Maryland 200 or the ICC now intersect I-95, way back in the 64 plan. Um, these were among some other corridor cities, sort of concentrated future growth areas uh, that the county envisioned at that time. There were some south of the Beltway and along I-270. You, you largely see those um, having come to fruition now. Um, the first master plan for the Fairland area was approved in 1968. That continued the vision of a corridor city to be to be developed here, really at the intersection between Montgomery County and Prince George's County. It, it overlapped both borders as part as a part of that plan. Um, so that was the future vision that had yet to be realized, but it was the plan for the area at the time. Um, we found in our research that there was a state moratorium on development in 1970. And this was based on sewer capacity, largely, uh, I believe. Um, and that led to a rethinking of the planned development, the vision for the area. Um, so that by 1981, there was an updated plan called the Eastern Montgomery County Planning Area Plan. This covered the Cloverly area, Fairland area, White Oak. It eliminated the corridor city um, as part of the vision for this area. And it reduced the development potential to be uh, more, more of moderate to lower density residential, large tract um, office buildings, really sort of took away that the corridor city, the clustered, um, we might call it a transit oriented development today, but really an, an exurb area, it really removed that from the books as far as what the planning policy and, and development allowances um, were in place. Um, and change the character of the future, change the future of the area at that time. Um, there was an additional development moratorium for the Fairland and White Oak area between 86 and 91. Um, and this was largely due to road constraints, um, too much congestion, roads were just filling up too much and, and causing problems. 
in the region. And so that further limited the development potential in the area. Um, and that planned development, lower density development was upheld in the 1993 County General Plan and the latest adopted master plan for the Fairland area, the 97 plan. Um, so I wanna give a little bit more of that background before I explain kind of what that means today. Uh, so in recent years, the County Council has changed the transportation test, the, the test that uh, planners and um, review authorities use to consider development. Um, it's been changed from looking solely at the existing roadway capacity and replaced with what is considered to be a more transparent and balanced approach. It really shifted the focus from um, looking at development applications based on the capacity of the existing transportation system um, that would limit the growth or limit the new units or retail or commercial space to what could be accommodated by the existing transportation system. The new approach is now looking at um, determining what projects are needed to accommodate the master plan goals. So where a master plan or a sector plan might uh, anticipate new infrastructure, new roads, new transit, new connections in its um, planning document, those need to go hand in hand with development. So they're no longer linked one for one. Um, and maybe Chris that uh, we're gonna move to after me can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding of how this new approach has taken. Um, and so I, I pulled a quote actually from Thrive Montgomery, which is the, the current general plan update that's moving towards adoption. And I thought it summed it up pretty well. I just wanted to read it here. Um, the removal of the Route 29 growth corridor, that's the corridor city area that was envisioned back in 68, effectively directed new public and private investment away from the East County and towards the established urban ring and I-270 corridor. As a result, the I-270 corridor has benefited from successive cycles of investment and reinvestment, even as other corridors, including Georgia Avenue, and it doesn't say it, but Fairland, the Fairland area, were largely left behind. This recurring pattern aggravated the racial and economic disparities between the eastern and western parts of the county that remain today. So that's, that's really, I think, a good summary of the history of development in the area and the impact that plans and planning policies and the planning vision, you know, the, the official uh, regulations really through zoning also, the impact that it's had on this area. And while some people welcomed that there was no growth and limited development to just homes and, you know, low density, I think it has also resulted in less commercial vitality, less stability for wealth creation, um, you know, less amenities. There are parks and recreational facilities and public uh, community centers, but really I think it, it's less of a place that people seek out compared to communities along 270, 495. So that's, I think what we're, the thread we're trying to pull on and figure out as far as how the development pattern has influenced um, how people live there today. Awesome. And just for the folks who might be new to the planning process and not familiar with the terminology that we use, could you just explain the difference between zoning and land use before we get to the next sure. question? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's what we learn in school uh, before we get a job planning for the county, um, the, the, the planning commission. But it, it really is something to be um, understood before we can have this conversation. So that's a good question. Um, so I mentioned the general plan of, for the whole county, master plan, sector plan. There's also functional plans. These are sort of the overall visions, the frameworks for how development, redevelopment, or even preservation can occur in the future. They, they set up the future conditions, the, the guideposts, um, and the concepts for what will happen in the future. They're very high level. Um, and they often need to be refined or implemented through other ways, such as through a zoning ordinance, through capital budgeting, um, other government programs, assistant programs, housing, and, and so forth. Also community actions, you know, how does an HOA participate? So the land use plans and policies that we talk about in the general plan, master plan, sector plan, those kind of things, those are those high level policies. Um, 
they have to be implemented by the zoning ordinance, the zoning map. So there might be a map of colors or uh, acronyms in the master plan that says this is residential, this is commercial, this is mixed use, but those need to be implemented through the zoning map, which get a lot more specific and say maybe what the residential density can be, what the maximum density could be, whether you can have mixed uses of people living above shops, whether you can have um, auto sales or industrial parks, that sort of thing. So th those regulations are established in the zoning ordinance that's a separate regulatory document that is adopting the land use policies. The zoning ordinance could also include development standards like site coverage limits, building setbacks, heights, parking spaces, how much public and private open space you need, stormwater management, that sort of thing. These are not specific regulations that the master plan will, uh, will include. So those are those often separate, they're administered separately, but they go hand in hand, they're, they're related to each other. Um, and then quickly at the end of a, of a development application, say, before it can be built, they have to go through a building code review. And so that's as far as life safety, structural and mechanical plumbing, that's an additional set of rules for development that stems from the master plans policies, the zoning ordinance, but it's really the this, this separate, how do you build this and how, how are people gonna be safe in it once they're occupying the buildings? Awesome. No, that was a great, that's a great response. We're going to jump into something that we hear a lot or we've heard a lot when we were doing our community engagement about the commercial market. And um, what we've heard in the community is that um, they would like more competition, they would like more places where they could go dine. And so I just wanted to kind of um, <clears throat> zoom into what the capacity, what the commercial capacity is like in the, um, in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney area. Could you give us a little bit, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, you you touched on what people are wanting, I think, well, it's, it's more options for grocery, restaurant, sitting, um, also maybe entertainment, community gathering spaces, those, those could be public or private. So those are the things that we've heard that people want. As far as the capacity for that sort of growth and development, uh, under current zoning rules, so what the current zones are and what they would allow today. Um, we did some calculations and uh, through a theoretical maximum build out, so this is assuming that everything built to the maximum allowed, um, there could be an additional 9 million square feet of either commercial or residential area um, on properties within the master plan area. So that's the, the short section of US 29, from Paint Branch up to about Greencastle Road. So that extent, um, if you can envision, or maybe if you're looking at the map in a different place. So that amount of, of floor area could be built. That, that would you know, be several layers as well. That's not just one story buildings. Um, so 9 million square feet could be added um, and possibly an additional 540 additional units of, of residential units. That's not a lot. So really, there's not a lot of zoning. Um, there's not a lot of zones that would allow additional residential units. Um, this is all theoretical, of course. So other site conditions and zoning requirements could reduce that. Um, but this—that's the theoretical maximum. I think that compares to, you know, about 2.5 million square feet of commercial space that's in place today. So it, it is an additional factor. Um, I don't know if I can do that in my head, maybe um, four times, six, uh, carry the seven, something like that. Um, so it, it's a lot more that could be built potentially, but most of these properties will never be built to that extent. You know, there's, there's large office buildings on large properties that will never be built out to maximum. Some will though. And so those are the kinds of things that we wanna think about and hear from the community and contemplate what the market um, will bear and what is, I think, appropriate and desirable for the community to add this new development. And are there places that we need to change that, that zoning allowance? That's the kind of thing we're gonna think about as, as the plan moves forward. So does that answer your question? Is that really the- That absolutely does. Okay. And that also um, is a good transition when you said, what the market will bear. I think it's also 
um, capacity as far as the roads are concerned. Um, I did say that it was that Fairland and Briggs Cheney is a destination, but what I meant was is that the 29 acts as a, a direct connection for most people. So it's a highly traveled commuter road um, on Route 29. And so I'm gonna bring Chris into the conversation now, but I do wanna put a pin in something that I heard Clark say and, and, and that Chris is gonna get into and, and let us just know that transportation is one of is the heart of the plan. It's going to be the most extensive um, as far as uh, what you're going to hear tonight. But um, these things didn't happen on accident. So over time, you know, these things with history and how it's shaped out today, um, that's that's what the importance of history is for us is is to be able to look back and see what happened in the past and how it's how it shows up in the existing conditions today. So I'm gonna bring Chris into the conversation around the topic of one of the most oldest ways of um, getting around of town, which is pedestrian safety. Um, but Chris, of course, first um, introduce yourself. And um, after you introduce yourself, please tell us um, a little bit about, um, a little bit about the, I'm sorry, I'm losing my place. What are some of the concerns as it relates to pedestrian safety? Um, Chris, are you there? Yep, I'm, I'm here. Oh, great, awesome. Hi everybody, Chris Van Ostein. I'm uh, also with the Up County Planning Team uh, working on the Fairland Briggs Training Master Plan. So nice to, nice to see you all. I'm uh, the designated uh, transportation planner here. Uh, so the, the issue, the question was on uh, what are the issues with, with pedestrian safety and, and more broadly even, even just safety in the, in the master plan area and uh, there, there are many, many, many. Uh, I, I think it would be safe to say that uh, there are very few places in the master plan area that are safe and comfortable to, to get around uh, either by walking, rolling, or even driving. It, it, is, it is a very, very difficult place to get around. Uh, so the the, these major roads, major arteries that uh, we, we've discussed uh, are, are kind of a double-edged sword that they, they both provide this tremendous regional and long distance connectivity, but at the same time, they, they, they uh, are one of the many barriers that uh, are uh, present in the community. And you have both the ICC, which, which kind of separates the community on a north-south basis and, and US-29 on, on an east-west basis. Um, so just from the very start, uh, those, those are major barriers. Uh, on top of that, uh, we have a lot of uh, large scale roads that feed into these, these highways. So things like uh, uh, Briggs Cheney Road, Fairland Road. Um, these, are, these were built uh, to convey uh, large amounts of traffic and, and, and they do indeed convey a lot of, lot of traffic. And it's a, very simply difficult to, uh, for vehicles and people to coexist happily and comfortably. So right off the bat, there, there's, there's uh, some, some major challenges going beyond there, uh, what little infrastructure we have for, for cyclists, for, for pedestrians, uh, for people with disabilities uh, is, is very deficient. We have sidewalks that are uh, built right against the road when, when they're even built. Uh, quite a lot of walking is done on uh, non-public routes, so on, on private land, on HOA land, in, in parking lots, um, through um, you know bits and pieces of forest, uh, on dirt paths, uh, places where the, there just isn't adequate infrastructure. So the, the, the big picture is there's, there's a lack of connectivity, a lot of major barriers, uh, a lot of dangerous intersections, a lot of fast moving traffic, and uh, and just a very, very difficult, challenging atmosphere for pedestrians. I, I, I've got, walked through the neighborhood uh, neighborhood several times. Um, I, I kind of, unfortunately, think of it as kind of a combination of a, of a maze as well as an obstacle course. Um, so it's the maze is, is means it's hard to get around, and then the obstacle course is just literally at times uh, dodging traffic or or dodging potholes or dodging trees. Uh, or tripping on uh, uneven pavement. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on. Um, we have a lot of work cut out for us. Uh, I, can, I can say that. We do, we do indeed. And so I wanna kind of um, also bring in the, the historical context here and just ask you as a result of the 1997 plan, can you kind of tell us what has been improved as a direct result of the 1997 plan? So there, there were a lot of, uh, you know, significant successes of that plan, um, some of them which 
maybe uh, are a bit of a mixed blessing at this point. So a lot of it were uh, recommendations to uh, increase capacity on, on these highways, uh, really prepare things for um, increased uh, speeds and capacity. So that's particular for US 29, but also you know, prepared the, the, the scene for the ICC. And now we have the major interchange uh, between those two roads in the, the master plan area. So a lot of it was um, putting uh, bridges and, and interchanges with uh, some of these um, uh, arterial roads, like, like Briggs Cheney Road comes to mind, uh, getting that grade separated to, again, increase capacity, increase speeds. Um, those, were, those were huge, very, very expensive projects that took many, many years, um, a lot of sweat and effort to get them done. Um, but at the same time, as I mentioned, they, they, they now have uh, some, some cost to this day uh, that it, it net, it's now very hard to, to walk around. Um, so, you know, it, 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 we did get a lot out of that plan. It may not be now something that we're as uh, thrilled with the repercussions. Um, maybe a brighter spot was the, the recommendation to um, implement uh, the, the, first, our, the county's first BRT, the, the uh, flash system. So we now have two lines that are up and running uh, starting in, in 2020. So that was a recommendation in the plan. Uh, it didn't really have some uh, specifics on how, how to implement it, but you know, we, we have experts at DOT that, that got it done. It's up and running and, and uh, it's quite successful so far. Um, some of the other recommendations uh, on, on bike and pedestrian infrastructure are, are still <laughs> still lacking. So after uh, 20 plus years, we're, we're still waiting on um, on, on better uh, better infrastructure there. Now you you talked about two things I want to touch on. First is the um, you know you had mentioned some of the development patterns or historic development patterns that may have caused mobility challenges. I just wanted you to elaborate on that first. And they may be, could you also talk about the BRT and its connection with other bus routes and things like that? That's right. So it's not, you know, transportation uh, plays, it's, it's, a, it's a multi tiered game here. It's not just the roads and sidewalks, infrastructure, all that, that concrete and asphalt that we think about. Um, it's really about connecting things. It's connecting the places. Um, so it's also a great amount of, of land use. So when, when you, we have land uses that um, often purposely separate things, it, it's also part of the equation, makes things very hard to get around. Uh, so the, the land use, um, I, you know, several people have talked about the, the history. Brian talked about how this area developed in the, the auto age. This is um, the time of, of uh, houses way, way in the, the suburbs. And they, these were primarily connected uh, along things like cul-de-sacs, so off of main roads, uh, as opposed to, you know, some of our historic downtowns, which went across roads or along um, trolley lines. Uh, this, this was largely a product of, of the auto age, so people getting around by cars. It was planned for cars. It was planned that uh, everybody in a house would have a car and get around by that. Uh, so when you have a community that's, that's built around, you know, uh, kind of these non-connecting streets, uh, the, the repercussion is it's, again, it's very difficult to get from point A to point B in anything but a car. Uh, so if you look at uh, a lot of the, the land use, it, it kind of branches. So you have uh, almost like leaves on a branch and uh, collections of branches leading to a bigger branch. Um, so if you think of yourself as maybe an ant on those branches going from one leaf to another leaf, you got to walk from whatever point on that leaf is down to the stem, down to the branch, up the branch, and up the next leaf, as opposed to just making that, that direct connection. Um, what we like to see is something more in uh, our downtown areas is, is more of a more of a grid, you know, it's something more like a, a fishing net, where you know, if you're again to go back to that ant analogy, you could just simply walk across that grid anywhere you want and, and get to where you want to go. Um, so if you're going from a one point uh, one leaf to another leaf, one cul-de-sac to another cul-de-sac going down that single single stem, uh, it, that can significantly increase your travel time. So you're, you could be walking what could have been, you know, a, a simple, in some cases, going uh, to your neighbor across, uh, you know, across the fence. Uh, what could have been a neighbor, you, you sometimes have to walk 10, 15 minutes. Uh, one case, uh, we, we had a, just on Google Maps, we found a pair of houses, uh, that are 45 minute walk apart from each other, uh, even though they're, they're technically neighbors. 
Um, another big barrier is simply barriers. Uh, people put up there. This uh, one of the major concerns is, is security. So I mean, we know that that's a major concern of community members. Uh, but uh, the, the downside to that is that we have a lot of very large, very robust fences, which which do separate communities, and that's that's another um, uh, difficulty to, to simply get around. Yep. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate you. I'm going to change gears here just to kind of make up some time and also talk about, we're still in the built environment here, folks. We're still talking about transportation, but now we're gonna shift a little bit to housing. I'm gonna bring Lisa in with us, our housing specialist. Um, so far you guys are doing great answering these questions, by the way, very thorough, I appreciate it. So uh, let's jump into the housing issue, which is another big issue for the community that we hear about, but there, there's this um, cost and affordability and, and that people are having issues with maintaining um, the, well, really having an affordable place to live. Um, so I want to spotlight Lisa, and I'm going to ask Lisa first introduce yourself. But then once you introduce us, once you introduce yourself, tell us uh, what type of housing exists in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community. Sure. Thank you, Molly. Um, for the record, or I guess we're not the planning board, so not for the record, but good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gavoni. I work on housing policy for the planning department, and I'll be developing a lot of the housing recommendations along with my colleagues help for the housing element of the Fairlands Big Training Plan. And we're gonna be looking at strategies for redevelopment, but also strategies for preservation and growth of our affordable housing stock in the plan. So what kind of housing exists in the Fairland Bricks Cheney area? So the area, um, the study area has about 14,000 housing units, which is about 4% of the county's housing units. Um, the study really area has a really good mix of diverse housing types. They have large multifamily facilities that have you know, 50, 50 or more units. We also have a lot of the, these smaller apartment buildings that have five to 19 units. But like most of the county, over half of the units in the study areas are attached and detached to units. So 27% of the units are attached and 28% are detached. So they, single family homes are the dominant uh, housing type in the plan area. Okay, could you also tell us a little bit about this affordability component? Like what, tell us a little bit about affordable, affordable housing in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney area and are, are residents truly cost burdened? Sure, so the one thing that's important to note is the Fairland and Briggs Cheney study area, the housing is dramatically more affordable than the county. Rents are 20% lower, but they are growing. They're, they've been the highest they've ever been in 2021. And the county's, but the county's median sold price is also 38% lower in the county. But I think it's important to mention, you know, what Clark talked about earlier in Commissioner Verma is that this area has seen a lot of disinvestment um, or lack of public investment. And we see that evident in the impact in our housing prices when we this area has, you know, like you talk, the commercial vitality and people want to be near exciting areas. So we see that impact in our prices and we'll be looking at ways to make this more of a vibrant mixed income community. But I also think it's important that affordability, yes, it's true that in dollars and cents, this is a very affordable area for the county. But there are more cost burden renters, 60%, which is more than half, compared to 49% in the county. So there so yes, it's cheaper, but I think it's important to note that when we talk about how affordable an area is, it's important that affordability doesn't always translate to the people that live there. And those are the people that are struggling to live in this area that are spending more than 30% of their income on housing. If I didn't mention that's what cost burden is, and they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. So sorry if I didn't mention that. Awesome, no, you did great, you did great. And I'm gonna transition now to schools, which is the last part of our uh, built environment. Thank you very much, Lisa. We're going to go to Hesu. And the first question, of course, after you introduce yourself, please, Hesu, introduce yourself. But your first question is around, um, uh, oh, I've lost my, my way. I'm so sorry. Which, uh, what, what type of um, schools exist in the Fairland and uh, Briggs Cheney community? Um, Hesu, are you there? Yeah, hi, um, good evening. I'm Hey Supek. Um, I'm the schools planner in the countywide planning and policy division. Um, so in terms of schools, um, the Fairland Briggs Cheney area, similar to how the Silver Spring plan was, not necessarily a lot of the other master plans that we've done. 
is um, served by multiple different schools, even at the high school level. That means the students living in the plan area, although it might be a small area, go, um, go to different schools, um, depending on where they live. Um, so at the elementary school, um, we have four schools that um, serves the plan area, which is Fairland Elementary School, Galway Elementary School, Greencastle Elementary School, and William T. Page Elementary School. Um, at the middle school level, there's Benjamin Banneker Middle School and Briggs Cheney Middle School. And then at the high school, there's James Blake High School and Paint Branch High School that um, I guess by default um, are the high schools that someone would um, be going to. But at the same time, at the high school level, um, the, these high schools are part of what's called a Northeast Consortium. So students that are living in the plan area and might be zoned to either Blake or Paint Branch High School still have an option to apply to, I don't know if apply is the right word, choose to go to Springbrook High School um, because they're generally a different type of educational program that they can choose from. So the high school is a bit different in that sense. Um, another thing to point out here is that the elementary schools, um, the four elementary schools are all considered what's called a class size reduction school, um, which is part of an educational initiative that MTP has started around 2000, the year 2000, um, to um, improve um, student performance in schools, especially highly impacted by poverty and language deficiency. Um, so three of the schools, Fairland, Galway, and Greencastle, um, are supported by actual federal um, Title I program. And um, William T. Page Elementary School is not considered a Title I school, but still what MCPS or Montgomery County supports um, and is called a focus school. So they um, operate with classrooms sizes that are smaller than what would be considered a normal classroom size in Montgomery County schools. Okay, could you tell us what a, um, a class reduction, what a class reduction schools are? Oh, so that's what I um, just mentioned. Um, these are so schools that are highly impacted by either poverty or language deficiency. So MCPS will use a staffing guideline that is smaller than regular non-class size redu reduced schools. Um, the one thing to point out here is though, many people tend to understand the level of overcrowding at their kids' school by the number of kids in the classroom. But um, that is not the right indicator of um, overcrowding and the planning department we use the word overutilization. Um, so the class size is generally a, um, a result of staffing ratios. So these class size reduction schools will, will have smaller staffing ratios and their classroom class number of kids in a classroom will be smaller. If a school, a class size reduction school becomes overutilized, overcrowded, quote unquote, um, instead of the class the class is getting bigger, um, there will be portable classrooms being used on site. So it's just a clarification between what people might perceive as overcrowding and what in the planning department and MCPS as well would actually consider as overcrowding. Got it. And last question for you, just before you go. Um, as a result of the 1997 master plan, what, what type of lessons have we learned about um, the recommendations that were made for that plan versus today? How, how are they shaping out in our existing conditions? So the one actual recommendation that came out of the 1997 plan was to um, dedicate an elementary school site from the golf course community that could support the number of students um, that may be coming from the additional health, housing units. Um, what happened is the school site has been dedicated, but um, it has um, there aren't any plans to use it as a new school site yet. Um, one thing is the existing schools have um, capacity or capability to, to have classrooms added. So a new school, you know, which costs a lot more than adding um, classrooms at an existing site. Um, so that has not become a necess necessity for MCPS yet. Another um, rather lesson learned um, from the 1997 plan is what happened around then um, that the plan did um, mention um, because the high schools around the time 
the plan was um, being made were overcrowded across the area. So the plan mentions, oh, these schools will be relieved by a new high school coming in the Cloverly planning area, which is Blake High School um, today. So the one other thing that the plan does mention, not in the school section, but in some of the community or housing um, parts of the uh, master plan is how there's a concentration of MPDUs um, and then there's an imbalance of housing units. Um, so when we look at this from the school's perspective and what happened when Blake High School opened was that there was a lot of controversy over how to reassign students to the new school because several high schools were overcrowded. And if, if they simply reassign students based on geography, they will have very disparate um, types of disparate schools in terms of student demographics because of how disparate the communities um, um, that will be you know, reassigned by this new high school look like. So it's um, a, a lesson learned is that schools are another, I guess, um, I guess housing has an implication on schools that have in a way a longer lasting impact um, so when, when this, the plan mentions um, certain things that may have caused the MPDUs to be concentrated in the area and how the policy has improved so that doesn't happen, the effect still stays in the schools. So it just emphasizes how important it is when we are laying out housing patterns and plans to understand the um, influence it might have on other things outside of school outside of housing um, and very importantly schools. Very thorough. Thank you so much, Hesu. Um, as we move into the next part of our quick fire interviews, I did see a comment in the um, chat regarding the bridge, the bridge, the <laughs> bridge, the Nile, and it has everything to do with transportation. So I just wanted to um, give Chris an opportunity to kind of weigh in. It says, I must take exception regarding the US 29 interchanges and why they are supported by Fairland. The ones at uh, East Randolph Road, Briggs Cheney Road and 197 are explicitly intended to bridge the Nile and make it easier to walk or bike around US 29. So I just wanted to throw that out there and see if you had any um, insight that you wanna comment on the comment in the chat. Yeah, just very quickly, uh, you know, I'm not going not to sit here and, and defend uh, these bridges. You know, I, I think that the engineering challenges of crossing a major highway like US-29 are, are severe. And I understand that there, there were, um, you know, compromises made to, to get that to be accomplished. Uh, the reality, you really need um, to get a, a high quality crossing there. It would have to be a separate facility. It, it, it's very difficult to... Um, uh, conjoin both a highway interchange bridge plus accommodate uh, bike and pedestrians all in all in one facility. It's very difficult. And, and even beyond that, even even if we were some time to get such a facility, uh, you know, remember we're, we're crossing, you know, several hundred feet of of asphalt, of, of you know, high speed vehicles, of noise. I mean, um, the best case scenario, we'll get something that that'll be noisy, that'll be uncomfortable, that in, in the summertime will be in the middle of the sun, and it'll be hot and uncomfortable. Uh, so that's that's a, it's a major challenge. No matter what we do, what we have in place is certainly not uh, what we ideally want. Uh, it, it accomplished the goal of providing additional capacity, but it, it didn't. It, it certainly did not. Long story short, did not did not cross the Nile, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. So we've talked about the people, we've talked about the place, we've talked about the built environment. And so we're gonna transition now a little bit into the natural environment. And I'm gonna start the conversation with our parks department. We've heard a lot about parks. People enjoy the parks, especially Fairland and Briggs Cheney because it has a lot to offer. And I'm gonna to go to Rachel now and I'm gonna ask her first, introduce yourself, Rachel, who is another great colleague who has, um, that has extensive experience on master planning teams. It has been a pleasure working with you, Rachel, as well as everyone here. Thank you so much. Um, but Rachel, your first question is, how has history shaped the acquisition, uh, the purchase of uh, parkland for the Fairland and Briggs Cheney 
community specifically. Rachel? Yes, hi everybody. Um, good to see you all. I'm very happy to be here to talk about parks. My name is Rachel Newhouse. I'm a park planner. And as far as the history of acquisition for parks in the Fairland Briggs Cheney area, the Paint Branch Stream Valley Park, um, which is one of our major beautiful Stream Valley parks, was part of the original acquisitions of the county. So that happened very early on. We still look to acquire land in the, fair, uh, the Paint Branch area whenever possible. But then in the 60s, the Fairland Recreational Park, which is to the north of this plan area, um, started to be acquired. Um, it's a very large park, so we've gotten some good chunks of land. And again, we still hear of interest in people who maybe want to donate or sell us their land to grow that park. Um, and then we have a smaller park, the Edgewood Neighborhood Park, which was acquired, um, I have it in mind, I'm going to say like in the 1980s, but that was to um, really serve the new housing communities that were coming online at that point. Awesome. Tell us how many parks exist in the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community? Yeah, so in our plan area, there are not many. There's the Paint Branch Stream Valley Park, there's the Edgewood Neighborhood Park, and then there's the Fairland Recreational Park. Slightly outside of our boundary, we have a few more, um, but we have noticed that this, this particular plan area is somewhat lacking in either parkland or open space, um, privately owned uh, recreational space. So three. <laughs> awesome. Um, I do want to shout out to Laura, who is also joining us tonight, who is with our sister agency, Prince George's County, and she has her information in the chat. So if you'd like to get in touch with Prince George's County about Fairland uh, Regional Park on the Prince George's Prince George's County side is Fairland Recreational Park on our side of, of the um, in Montgomery County. Um, and the last question for you, Rachel, is how walkable are the park's trails? Can you tell us a little bit about the amenities and specifically the trails? Because people rave about using the trails, but really enjoying the amenities in both of those parks. Yeah, the, the trail system throughout the Fairland Recreational Park is very walkable. There's a bunch of bike trails. We have a new bicycle um, challenge facility at Fairland. So hopefully you all can get out and experience that. Um, we have uh, some of the major trails that go through Paint Branch Stream Valley Park that also could connect you to other parts of um, our park system. And they connect you into Prince George's County. Um, and then there's just a small, you know, little small trail system through Edgewood. Um, you know, we can Im improve upon that, maybe make more of a loop. Um, but it's it's the access of getting people from their homes to our parks that we're very concerned about and, and you know, making that as easy as possible. Great job. We're going to transition to environment and I'm going to bring Catherine Catherine up and Catherine, of course, please do the same as everyone else. Introduce yourself, but tell us a little bit about the, how the history of this place has shaped the natural and existing conditions for Fairland and Briggs Cheney. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, Catherine Nelson. I am an environmental planner with the department, and I'm very happy to be working on this master plan area. The, um, the most interesting uh, feature environmentally uh, of this area is that it's along a, a fall line. We call it the fall zone between the coastal plain and the, um, the Piedmont plateau. And what that means is that um, you're going from a high elevation to a low elevation in a very short amount of time. And so uh, that historically has meant that um, this area used to be a shoreline. There used to be uh, uh, the water and the shore uh, right here in, in our planning area. And so 
that has shaped this area in so many ways. Uh, you have these gorge-like um, stream valleys, um, which we are fortunate to have preserved uh, many of them within parkland, like Paint Branch Gorge and within Fairland Park. Um, also, because of the uh, deposits um, from the uh, water that used to be in this area, there have been um, huge uh, sand and gravel operations that have taken place all along this fall area. And in this area, all the way up into um, even the 90s, there was still surface mining. Um, and I, there is, I believe there's still surface mining going on in Prince George's County, uh, just over the line. So these things um, have, have made a, a, a real impact on how the area is shaped and the natural environment that we have now. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges that we face with um, building? And so I'm going to kind of, um, you know, pull two questions together. There's a question about unbuildable area and there's a question about, um, you know, the challenges that we face moving forward. Could you talk a little bit about how the existing conditions might create problems for us with buildable areas or unbuildable areas? Well, buildable areas is, um, is, is usually a policy issue. It's not uh, exactly a uh, an issue of whether or not it's physically possible because uh, building can take place <laughs> in a lot of different ways. So um, in this particular area, it's these deep stream valleys. And if you live here, you know that there's these this steep drop off down into the stream valley and then a very wide uh, floodplain area at the base. And so we consider those, uh, because of Maryland's value in protecting water quality, protecting the Chesapeake Bay, um, we consider those undevelopable. Um, but that has also created a real challenge. And Chris talked about that. How do you get across these very deep stream valleys? Um, when you go across them on uh, the very few roads that do, you, you're looking down uh, into a very deep stream valley. And when you're trying to walk across some of these natural areas, say from one home to another that are on either side of the stream valley, it is very, very uh, challenging. Um, and going back to the value for protecting water quality and stream valleys, when this area developed our environmental uh, protections were mm, uh, not as strong as they are now. So the buildings were uh, placed um, right within the steep, steep drop off into the stream valley. These days we would have protected the stream valley all the way up to um, where it began to level off. And so unfortunately that has meant that it's it's difficult to actually access the, you, these vast natural areas that exist between the developments, even uh, for a pedestrian, let alone for someone who is biking or um, who is challenged and perhaps is in, in a wheelchair and, and not able to negotiate uh, the topography. This is, this is how I see uh, the, the environmental challenge is, is uh, it's difficult to go back once development has taken place and hemmed in these areas um, in such a strong way. And last question for you. Well, really, I'm gonna to try to bring two questions together again, but um, based on the 1997 Fairland rec uh, recommendations, which, what were the most successful outcomes of, of the 1997 master plan, and then if you could talk a little bit about um, the concern for climate change towards the end of your question, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, the, the 1997 plan and even the, the, plan, the plans before this um, were successful in, in protecting these um, stream valley parks. 
and 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 their incredible resources of um, not just recreation, but um, they they house rare, threatened, and endangered species. That's such an unusual ecosystem within this fall area. Um, there's, in fact, a, a park that is specifically um, to protect a um, magnolia bog, which only exists within this within this area, and that has been protected. Um, adjacent to and, and within an old surface mine area to uh, keep those areas um, available and in their natural state. Um, regarding um, uh, climate change, the area of most concern is where the greatest development has taken place and where some of the most important community gathering spaces are, uh, the commercial areas. And again, going back to um, how the environment has been viewed over the years, in the past, there has been an attitude that the environment is over there and the development is over here. And so you kind of draw a line wherever your policies are at that time. And then everything else is kind of a fire zone. And so you can see this, um, in say the automobile circle area where the shopping center is, it is, it is a vast barren desert like situation. Uh, even though you have these wonderful lush green areas um, throughout the community, these particular areas are, um, have not been designed to uh, be uh, for people. It's been designed for people who are in an air conditioned car. They get out and hopefully can run across the very, very warm parking lot and get into an air conditioned building. Um, this, this is not sustainable. This is not something that um, is going to work, especially as our climate heats up, our summers become uh, longer and even our nighttime temperatures uh, don't allow areas that are absorbing all of the sunlight to cool off uh, overnight. So uh, design is going to be very important in the future to design for, uh, for people rather than for cars. Um, well said. Well said. Thank you. Thank I you. Can, I can go on about this. Issue, I know. But, uh, I know. <laughs> I know. And I thank you for that because it's a good transition into food insecurity. So I'm going to bring Michelle, our last speaker, our last um, member of our team, Michelle Nelson, of course, introduce yourself first. But then your first question is what is food security and how many people are impacted in the county? Michelle? Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Nelson, and I'm the Community Garden Program Manager with Montgomery Parks. Um, but I have been working on various issues related to food systems in the county and with Montgomery Parks for a while now. And I am a native of this, of the planning area um, and of the county. So food, food security or food insecurity, sometimes you hear them interchangeably. But really when you're looking at food security, we're, we're looking at a measurement of, sometimes you'll see it in percentages, but we're looking at a measurement based on different factors that may impact access to fresh, nutritious, affordable food for all residents. Um, so this, um, a moment of um, food insecurity, or I'll say food insecurity for the sake of um, talking about the planning area, can exist for, um, it doesn't matter if it's only for a month, it doesn't matter if it's for a year, it doesn't matter if your um, children are impacted by it, you know, when they maybe don't have food on the weekends or that kind of thing. Um, all of that is factored into what food insecurity actually means. And in Montgomery County, this number has fluctuated a little bit, um, especially with COVID. But according to Capital Area Food Bank right now, um, the county actually for this particular study area, food insecure, the food insecurity rate is about 12%. 
Um, overall in the county, it's about 16% uh, in some other areas, but in the areas of the county where it's lower impact, it's about 7%. So it really is all over the map, but in um, the Fairland Brick Cheney area, it is on the higher end um, of people who are impacted by food insecurity. Um, in terms of a specific number in the entire county, it's just about under 115,000 um, folks who were impacted by food insecurity. Awesome. I find it very fascinating too, as we bring this, um, as we talk about food, that this area was a farming community. And so at, at one point people did farm the land and, and now present day we're food insecure. So I'm curious, um, in community, community and farming kind of go hand in hand. So I want to ask you a question about the community partnerships and what type of role they play in creating a robust food system. Like what is a food system and what are the partners that we need to have to build out this program? Yeah, great question. Um, in technical terms, we use the, the terminology food system, which examines the distribution, processing, consumption, production, um, really all these different factors that go into making um, and consuming and distributing food. So, you know, a lot of people think that they don't have a role in the food system, but we all have some type of, we all have our, <laughs> our mouths or our hands in um, food systems. And sometimes when people talk about food systems, they're talking about local food production, they may be talking about agriculture, but then they also may be talking about um, public health and how food and public health kind of intersect with one another. Um, there was another part of your question that I just like totally went out of my mind for a second. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. It's all around partnerships and building out um, local food system. Yes, so in the food system, you know, we talk about your we're looking at production, we're looking at distribution, we're looking at consumption and how everybody plays a role in the food system. We can't do this without partnerships. We can't do this without community. So in the um, planning area, we really have a strong, robust group of partners, especially after COVID um, in the East County hub, which are various partners that include MANA, various houses of worship, um, that really have come together to create avenues and kind of build up the food system. So helping people get more access to food, sharing resources for where they can pick up food, um, having distributions on multiple days throughout, um, throughout the week, and then also trying to collaborate to make sure that they're, they're not over, they're not, you know, overlapping their efforts, but still providing that coverage for people who may need it. Um, Rainbow Development Center is also another great partner in the area that has really just done a lot in terms of helping people get fresh, nutritious food. Um, and most people are familiar with Mana Food Center, but they do have a brand new or fairly new facility or office um, right outside of the planning area near Tech Road. So they are a partner that has really tried to just bring new programs to the eastern part of the county to, again, uplift and kind of give more support to the food system in this planning area. Okay, and last question. It's about youth and schools. So I'm going to tie two questions together, really. Um, what's the intersection of food systems and schools? And, you know, is there, is there work in engaging the youth in this in this conversation around food systems? Great question. So one place where food systems and schools and youth always interact or kind of come together is in the school system, right? Um, so in Montgomery County Public Schools, um, one of our colleagues had just talked about most of the schools in the um, planning or study area. So all of the schools within the study area, except for one, um, at least 60% of the students are eligible or currently taking advantage of 
free and reduced meals. So uh -huh. that's a very, very high number for students and for youth in that area. So, um, you know, over 50% <laughs> is really high. Um, and so there are certain initiatives that are happening when we're talking about um, you know, partners with the Montgomery County Food Council. There's a gardening subcommittee group that does cover or kind of discuss school gardens and how can you get more engaged. Um, also, they talk about um, there's a parent group group that is like Healthy Kids Montgomery that is also advocating for healthier school meals, which is also something that we heard from um, from community members um, during this process. So. And hopefully there'll be new initiatives that come on board um, in the uh, study area that will also encourage more families to get involved in either, you know, visiting a farm or growing in a community garden or just learning how to do certain things like cooking at home um, is one also introduction to the food system and kind of, again, um, exposure but then also tying in self-sufficiency and community and how do we just improve the lives overall of a lot of our residents. And that's a great way to close too. You are our last person. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate you. I'm gonna bring um, my co-lead in to kind of wrap up here. Um, we are now at 7.36 and we do intend on ending on time, but, um, there's been some conversations happening in the chat around density and the distribution of density. And, and for those who might not be familiar with um, a, what a TDR is or um, density, I just wanted to kind of talk around that just a little bit to kind of give some insight to someone who might be new to this process and might not know what a TDR is and whether or not um, the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community has been affected by um, in the conversation in the chat, it would seem so. So um, Clark, is there anything that you can kind of expand or glean from what's happening in the chat? Sure, I can give it a try. Um, being a new employee this year, I don't know if I can go into all the nuance. No, so, I know. Uh, Thank if, you for being a good support. If any citizens know more than me, please you can uh, feel free to speak up as well. <laughs> um, but uh, there is an aspect of transferable development rights as part of the zoning uh, ordinance and the zoning map that is placed on properties that allows density to be moved, allowable density to be moved from one area of a county that's set up as a sending um, zone to another area that's a receiving zone. And it, it's sort of like an overlay. It goes on top of what already exists there. And so um, I just, as we were looking at that, I just pulled up the zoning map and it does look like there are a number of properties that have uh, TDR or transferable development rights uh, applied to them in the Fairland Briggs Cheney area. Um, some are outside of our master plan area specifically, but in, in the local area. Um, so it looks like sort of near Paint Branch, just south of Randolph Road, there's a, a cluster of homes that were built with that method that were able to get a little more density than otherwise allowed. Um, but in general, there really aren't a lot that are applied in this master plan area. There's some that are just beyond. Um, looks like one that's at the intersection of I-270, no, sorry, Maryland 229, so I don't know how that worked out. I know there's no homes or businesses there. Uh, but that, that's something we're going to have to take a look at as far as understanding um, what areas could receive those new TDR areas in the future, maybe what the capacity is for um, achieving them or what impacts they would have. You know, as far as the, the vision and the desire for new development and increased density or preservation of, of open space or low density, that's something that we, through this process to develop the master plan, will need to figure out what is the preferred uh, level of growth um, community character, uh, density in the area, new developments, how do we you know, keep things the way they are in certain areas? We want to hear from the community. This is, you know, this presentation really is not about what the answers are yet. We're still trying to figure out, and we have over the last several months, 
figure out what's on the ground and, and what's the historical context. But as we move forward, we really will be looking into um, how does the TDR program affect this area? Is there a need to dial it back? Are there certain opportunity areas to increase them or target them or you know, take, op take opportunities to fill in places that may need some, some revitalization, some activation? You know, there's all these little catch words that we use, but really just it's about how does the community see itself growing? What does it prefer to have in the future? Is it to keep things the way they are? Or is it to you know, have targeted areas that evolve over time and can be improved? Um, even improving existing developments, existing shopping centers, apartments, um, property maintenance, that kind of thing. So it really are our, our recommendations, the visioning that we wanna conduct later this summer, the recommendations that'll be developed for the plan, really will start to get out some of these questions with some answers as far as where do we see the community going in the future? How does the community see itself going into the future? So maybe that's a little bit of a roundabout way of passing the buck at this point, but I appreciate the active discussion. And these are certainly comments that we will take into consideration going forward. And I wouldn't say it's passing the buck because we are still, this is a continued conversation. I'll say the same thing that I said at the listening session. This is not the end, good people. We want you to join us. I'm gonna share my screen here and share the last couple of slides that we have here as we're coming to a close. And this is as we continue to dialogue, as we continue to have these conversations about the future of Fairland, there's a few things coming up. Of course, we have a, we have, um, a photo shoot that is going to be launched very soon. And this is something that we're trying to do to break down some language barriers and to use some graphic images because a picture says way more than words can sometimes. And we wanna be able to capture the essence of the Fairland and Briggs Cheney community with this um, spring photo contest. We have a community pop-up coming up at the East County Regional Services Recreation Center actually on the 29th from three to six, hope to see you there. We're also working out another pop-up at the Briggs Cheney marketplace. And then soon after we finish with our pop-ups in the month of April, and then we're thinking about another date in June, we're gonna start with um, our visioning work. And so you're not pass excuse me, you're not passing the buck because this is an ongoing conversation. I encourage you to stay engaged in this process and to offer your perspective and to reach out to us like Dan and Patrick have done. And we will continue to have these conversations. So it's not over. Please join us on Thursday too. I just want to remind you that we will be doing a presentation for the planning board, which will be different from the one that you heard tonight, which is why we did two different presentations so that you would come to see the one on the 21st, which will have more pictures and all of the people that you saw today joining us on this team. My name is Malene Jackson and um, I'm co-leading with Clark Larson and our contact information for everyone on the team is here. And so um, I leave with just, um, if you have questions, if you have any final questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat because now would be a good time. But while you're thinking of your burning questions, I do wanna also acknowledge some of our partners in the room and let you know that we've been working in the community, but also with the University of Maryland in particular to develop this um, PALS report. Um, we had the students take a look at the existing conditions and to give us their best um, assessment about what the future of Fairland and Briggs Cheney could do for us. And so you'll see that information um, being conveyed in our visioning sessions as we draw from, from, as we draw inspiration from their report. There were a few scenarios that they had provided in their report and we wanna draw inspiration um, from, from the work that the students have done at the University of Maryland. I also see everyday canvassing in the room, I want to acknowledge their presence as well. We could not do this work without you. They have provided an immense amount of data and they are right now in the community canvassing local businesses and gathering even more data for us to use um, to build this plan together. <clears throat> and so um, I don't see any burning questions in the chat as of this, as of lately, but um, we are getting to the point of closing this presentation. And so I do want to acknowledge every member on this team. Clark, thank you so much. I appreciate working with you. It's been a pleasure, even though we haven't worked together very long. You definitely have jumped in there and I appreciate you. I appreciate you. <laughs> We're jumping 
head first into, into this uh, beautiful place, this beautiful plan, the Fairland Bridge Cheney Master Plan. I'm going to acknowledge also Pam, Pam Sorridge. Thank you so much. Rachel Newhouse, Catherine Nelson, if you guys want to just turn your cameras on and just wave, because I think what we were trying to do too is I think we wanted to capture a photo of everybody. Rachel Newhouse, Catherine Nelson, even Patrick Butler's on here, Lisa Gavoni, Brian Crane, um, Michelle Nelson, Chris Ben Alstein, not to be confused with Chris Van Hollen, Lynn, um, Lynn Gill, Gil, sorry, Lynn, I always batch your name up. <laughs> Gilliton, Lynn, Gilliton. Please correct me. You can unmute yourself and correct me. Gilliton, Gilliton, okay. Gilliton, thank you so much. I, I apologize. Um, Pam Zorridge, did I miss it? Hey, Sue, hey, Sue Beck, thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to just kind of go, Lauren, Laura, we, we already acknowledged you in the room. I see Rudy in the room. I see Upneet in the room. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind just turning on your camera, if you, if you wouldn't mind just turning on. Oh, I see Jeru. Thank you so much, Jeru, for coming and attending. We appreciate you and all the support you've given us. Roberto Duke, that we could not do everything without you. I'm trying to remember every single person so I can acknowledge them. But if anybody could just take a photo of what we're seeing right here and let me know when you're done, everybody say smile, say cheese. <laughs> Is someone taking a photo? <laughs> should I should I take a photo? Let me take a photo real quick. Sorry. Sorry, guys. We need these moments because this is history. Everyone well, say I've taken a few, but I okay, couldn't great. speak when I was doing it. <laughs> okay, great. No problem. All right. So everyone, it is now, we're ending early actually. Um, if there's no other questions, which I don't see any in the chat, um, have a good night. I appreciate you guys.